Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for that very kind introduction. Uh, what a privilege it is, really, for me to be here today uh, at a very personal level. Um, when Sarah asked if I would speak about public-private partnerships and how the goals of a BGRI could be advanced, um, I was thinking about the direct beneficiary that I am of the partnership which ensued as a result of the entry of Rockefeller Foundation and Dr. Borlaug in India in the 60s. The company that I work for, Mahiko, actually came about as a result of the promotion of quality seed program, which the Rockefeller, Pro Rockefeller Foundation promoted in the country. Dr. Borlaug, of course, spent much of his time and effort in the north, and I come from the central part of the country, so we promoted quality seed planting for improving overall productivity and availability of food grains. Wheat, wa wheat came about a little later in our area of activities, but so it is a great privilege for me to be here to talk about how um, we can look at what the partnerships were in the 60s and 70s and what it is that we can do today. Dr. Borlaug visited us in 2005, which was his last visit to India. And um, during his uh, visit, he interacted with a lot of school children uh, as one of the activities that he did. Everywhere he went in the country, uh, students would follow him. And some of the pictures that I will share with you in my presentation, uh, the age of the children could not understand who this man was and why people were behind him with garlands of flowers they wanted to put around his neck. So just to look at what was it that made um, the partnership in the 60s uh, so productive and efficient, if we look at a few key um, uh, points, uh, we were about 400 million people then, uh, today, a um, little more than 1.1 billion. Hunger and starvation was prevalent. Uh, today, we still have a little bit of that significant presence, prevalence, although we've made significant progress, but in terms of sheer numbers, we probably are looking at 300 plus million of the Indian population who goes to bed hungry or malnourished. If we um, look at India in the 60s from a net importer, the ship-to-mouth existence that everyone talks about, to the situation today, and this situation of bumper production over the last few years, our grain storage facilities don't have enough room for storing the, storing the produce, and that is a political challenge that the government has because of the criticism of distribution of that grain. Uh, Mr. President yesterday mentioned about uh, the tide, and he said how we are on the high tide at the moment with our grain production. We are a self-supporting, self-sufficient country, net exporter today than we were in the 60s. And this is a point that I want to emphasize during most of my presentation, is that if we don't realize that we are on the high tide and low tide is likely to come if we become complacent. Uh, one other point on this slide that I wanted to talk about is about the political will. And uh, Mr. Linus before me uh, talked about this a little bit, and I want to share one example of the serious commitment uh, by the government in the 60s to see that we would get out of the situation that we were in at that time. Um, Agriculture Minister uh, Subramanyam, of course, was very instrumental in the Green Revolution for wheat and rice, particularly. But even at the state level, for instance, um, when my father sold some of the early hybrids or varieties in the central state of Maharashtra, the governor or the chief of the state would receive complaints from the then activist saying that he's charging too much money for the bag of seed that he sold. So the chief minister decided to come to visit one, one such farm, and when he came to the farm, thousands of farmers gathered, including the activist, and they started with the, with, uh, you know, he's robbing us with the seed that he's selling. And the chief minister turned around to the crowd and said, uh, you are complaining that he is charging you too much money. 
I want 100 more barwales who can sell this seed so that the farmers will have seed which will give them more return. And that is the kind of leadership that we want today, as well as we look at how the partnership will work, the government's full commitment in, these, in the area of promotion of technology. The one big difference from the 60s to now is that the private sector was just beginning. Uh, we were one of the early private sector companies in India and established in 1964. But when we look today, we have more than 300 plus private seed companies which are registered with the National Association of Seed Companies. Um, everyone in the room is already familiar with the objectives of the BGRI, but I wanted to highlight how um, partnership opportunities uh, actually present themselves to address uh, these three key points. One very important point that I want to leave behind with you today, hopefully, is to see, uh, look at the serial price index uh, for India over the, over the years, and particularly look at the last six to seven years. Uh, when we had the sharp rise uh, in food prices uh, in 2008, uh, after the initial shock, everyone thought that the prices have gone back down and normalized. But when you look at the actual numbers, the price have continued to remain high. And high food prices, and they're much, much higher than what you see in the Green Revolution days. And those were the lowest prices that you ever saw, and because of high productivity and availability of grain. Uh, the high prices uh, impact the poorest of the poor, because they are the ones who can afford it the least. And so as we talk about productivity improvement, this is an important fact to keep in mind. Dr. Borlaug uh, said, take it to the farmer. And I wanted to start at the farmer as to what is it that BGRI needs to deliver and to look at what is it that the farmer wants. The farmer is really not bothered, uh, and I'm speaking very broadly, but is really not bothered whether the line is rust resistant, whether the line has um, you know, five tillers. The farmer is only interested in high yields. At the end of the day, if the farmer is making his or her livelihood uh, with farming, the yields are what determine what income the farmer is going to get. And the higher yields could be because of multiple um, factors which go into it, be it disease resistance uh, or stress tolerance, uh, germplasm and genetics, of course, that we look at, uh, traits, uh, genetic enhancement, um, higher market prices, the second component. So not only having the high, uh, high yields, but then how do you get higher price for that? And the farmer would typically get a premium if the quality of the seed is better for milling, better for bread making, or bread, better for pasta making, for instance. And on the other hand, the farmer is looking for lowering his or her costs. So the big costs that the farmer incurs are relate to fertilizer, pesticides, and then, of course, also water availability. In many states, uh, water is a commodity which is free, but in, as we look forward, water would be one commodity which is um, under demand from so many different sectors that agriculture would be the one which would have tremendous challenges in having adequate water. So uh, those are the things that the farmer wants. And then as we look at, um, and of course there could be many other things the farmer wants too, but I just thought the three components which will make sure that the farmer will adopt a variety or a hybrid or a product that uh, goes to the farm. What do we have uh, on the other hand? We have much better germplasm. Uh, we have many, many, many uh, tools at our disposal. Uh, we have hybrids, um, we have hybrid wheat as well in India, and then of course we have uh, technologies, uh, GM technologies or otherwise. We have also many, many challenges. Uh, climate change everyone talks about, uh, and I will break it down in my presentation a little bit going forward. Uh, look at a couple of components of that. Water, of course, is also somewhat related to climate change in terms of changing patterns of monsoon in India and how that would impact uh, crop cultivation and inputs in general. Uh, India is a net importer or actually imports most of its phosphorus, uh, imports a lot of its nitrogen fertilizer as well. So the government has to make a commitment of um, foreign exchange, which is, um, which is one of the very important factors that they 
monitor. The one other aspect that very little is talked about but should be an important factor, and this relates to the quality um, that I talked about earlier, is what does the processing industry wants? Uh, so they're also looking at price. So they're looking at a lowest price possible for their procurement. They're looking for quality and, of course, a market where they can take their processed products. Here's a picture of um, one of the school children that Dr. Borlaug interacted with uh, during his visit. And uh, it was delightful uh, to watch him talk to these little children and uh, spend time with them. And I think if he had his way, he would have spent all of his time in the school than any other place when he was with us. Um, just, just to look at what, what are the areas where we have opportunities for partnerships. And if we look at a very um, simplistic diagram of how the farmer gets their seed, uh, and what roles uh, different entities play in it. Uh, so we start with germplasm, go on to breeding, uh, to the product, which could be a high-yielding variety or a hybrid or a GM product, uh, and then go on to production, quality assurance, processing, and then marketing, and to the farmers. Uh, one of the critical things um, that is very challenging in the partnership uh, arena is uh, the understanding of how important each one of these steps is. So from a researcher's standpoint, once I have a product, uh, it is the best product. I don't need to do anything else. This should go to the farmer as such. But if you take that view and then go to production and it's so, so difficult to produce that product in the field at a commercial scale, it doesn't matter how good your product was, it's not going to be something that the, the commercial, commercialization of that product is going to be helped with. So one really has to look at this entire cycle and um, in a sense, uh, the public-private partnerships need to also understand that the research component is maybe one-third of the entire process of delivering something to the farmer and not the end uh, in itself. And once we have that understanding, then it would be much easier to form these partnerships and take things forward. I'm going to very briefly uh, share an example of recent partnership, and not uh, from the perspective of uh, this particular crop, uh, but just to illustrate how different partnerships have worked. In the 60s, there was the big partnership, which was public sector foundation, um, private sector, uh, and a significant push from the government uh, to a more recent example of the BT brinjal, uh, or eggplant as it is uh, known elsewhere. It's a common vegetable, uh, very popular in India, second only after potato. It, it has a very dense, meaty texture, so it becomes a very filling vegetable in the diet and a very low calorie vegetable. This particular um, uh, vegetable has a tremendous problems with insect pests. Uh, the lepidopteran pests uh, damage the fruits as well as the shoots. The shoot damage occurs first, followed by the, sh uh, by the fruit damage. Uh, a farmer in West Bengal may undertake up to 80 sprays uh, to control this pest, one pest, during a 150-day cycle of this crop. So we're looking at spraying the crop every other day. So it makes for a great case uh, in terms of a product which is uh, required, a crop which is uh, very specific to the region, the US or European countries grow very, very small amount of this crop, even though they have the same problem, but it's not high on their priority list. So when we look at this particular crop and then we look at the partnership that ensued, so Mahiko had developed BT eggplant mm, under the umbrella of ABSP2 project, which is run by Cornell University. We created a partnership uh, with three Indian public sector institutes uh, which are listed uh, in the slide as Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, Indian Institute of Vegetable Research, and University of Agricultural Sciences, Dharwad. We had two institutions in Bangladesh, um, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute and East West Seed Company, and then um, a partner in Philippines, the University of Philippines at Las Banos. 
this partnership um, it provided for an opportunity for sharing the technology which Mahiko had developed, which we were going to we are going to deploy in commercial products in the form of hybrids, and our partners would take it forward in varietal uh, forms which they developed and um, commercialize. Uh, eggplant is a very mature crop in a sense, uh, in the sense many, many players in the market for this crop, varieties, hybrids, and uh, hundreds of fruit types which are sold in the Indian market. So it made a very good, good partnership. As already discussed before, and I won't spend much time, so the product is ready to go, uh, awaiting political clearance. And this is a, an area which requires a whole different dimension of discussion, so I won't spend much time here on that. Going on to wheat and the possibilities of partnerships. Um, in case of Brinjal, I, uh, it was much more of a tech transfer type of an arrangement, whereas wheat uh, offers uh, many diversity of partnership possibilities. So we look at research-related partnerships. So clearly this group, uh, you couldn't find any more expertise in rust-related topics than uh, all of you present here. But uh, that is one aspect of um, uh, the partnership that's possible. So today as we look at it, and uh, Mr. Linus uh, talked about stacking of genes. Um, Ravi raised that point as well yesterday over dinner saying that if uh, we were able to stack these genes and put it all in once, uh, he could uh, uh, move those resources for other more productive activities than to continue to do the conventional approach that he had, provided we have a favorable environment. Um, uh, surveillance is another area where there is no engagement of the private sector uh, in these formal processes even though the private sector may do their own surveillance, but this is uh, no mechanism by which uh, that input is recorded. Uh, and if we think about the private sector and we think about uh, just, uh, for instance, our network of dealers and distributors and sales force, you could get at least 800 people working to get you d data or simple, simple feedback, oh, this particular field has some disease, can somebody go and look at it? So that does not happen today. When we talk about molecular tools, um, uh, many, many molecular tools are available. Uh, one of our challenges is to see how these tools are not just sitting in the laboratory, but are actually going out to the field. And um, this is our perception, could be wrong, is that uh, as long as uh, the public sector in general, uh, not everyone here, but general feels that they've uh, done the research, they've published their article, uh, the responsibility primarily ends there. And uh, of course, there are people here who uh, take it much beyond that. So how do, we, how do we create that partnership opportunity to engage um, this transfer of technology and also look at some models where the private sector is much more interested in screening 50,000 samples in three weeks' time rather than screening five samples in three months' time. So how do we look at these kinds of opportunities? I'm going to share some examples of GM traits which are available. And going back to my point earlier about what is it that the farmer wants, the farmer is looking for high yield. If you have rust tolerant variety, uh, but don't have some of the other traits like uh, fertilizer efficiency or uh, yield parameters uh, which may be available, then you don't have the optimum product that the farmer will be willing to buy. So uh, I will share some example. Quality is another example where there could be significant opportunities. The big area for a partnership which maybe is less controversial would be relating to downstream activities relating to production, quality assurance, and marketing and extension. So uh, just a couple of examples of uh, what is already available uh, with the private sector and is being tested uh, in the greenhouse uh, for most part at this moment because we don't have permission to grow it outside. Uh, the first example is um, of uh, herbicide tolerant wheat. Uh, this is an example uh, if you start at the left uh, top panel and then look at the uh, progression of how the weed control happens with uh, Roundup uh, spray or glyphosate spray. 
um, this particular technology in a wheat cultivation scenario in India, uh, the initial projections are could have impact of up to 15% yield enhancement just with the one particular technology. The other example I wanted to share is uh, relating to nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, the Green Revolution brought um, higher use of fertilizer in crop production, uh, which, has been, uh, which has been a, ver a great benefit uh, to the country. However, as I mentioned that India is an importer of fertilizer and depending on the availability of the fertilizer globally, uh, India really needs to look at what is it that they can do to improve efficiency. Most of the nitrogen which is applied is not available to the, uh, to the plant. And so this technology, which is a GM technology, uh, shows the, the, pla um, the two middle rows are what I would like you to focus on. The null is the, um, the plant with no gene for uh, nitrogen use efficiency, and the NUE is the plant with the gene. And you can see, if you leave aside the borders, which reflect the border row effect, if you look at the middle two rows, you can see the impact at the biomass level in case of rice. Same technology is also in available at this stage in wheat. Uh, the tiller number goes up, the seed number goes up, the panicle uh, also shows the effect of the nitrogen use efficiency. So with application of 30% less nitrogen, you can be at the same yield level, or you apply the same level of nitrogen today and have higher level of uh, production. So in either case, you, uh, you benefit, have a net benefit in productivity. The same thing shown at harvest, and again, you can see the stubble, leftover stubble in case of rice, and you see the difference between the null and the NUE and the significant impact that it has. Uh, this is a slide I had shared in an uh, earlier presentation I had made at uh, BGRI in, uh, in St. Paul, I think, where one of the things that the seed industry, for instance, is uh, very good at doing is moving seed out to the farmer's fields. And this slide um, uh, shows what would be the requirement of seed if we were to replace the existing varieties with rust tolerant varieties only. And who uh, do we have enough seed and are we capable of moving those seeds out? So this is an example whereby the private sector can have a significant role to play in distribution of seed material to the farmer's fields. So a few um, points to leave behind. Um, some, some say, and sometimes I say it as well, that public-private partnerships are very difficult to work, at least in today's circumstances, because our expectations are very diverse. Um, one problem is that uh, once um, research component is finished, the thought process that this is the end, it is, uh, you know, my product is worth $100 million, you pay me $50 million now, and then you do what you want with it. That is not how the private partnership will work, but this is the mindset that happens many times over and over again. So we really need to think about having a common goal in terms of rather than looking at an incremental increase in production productivity, we can, with just the two examples that I showed you, have the opportunity of increasing the wheat yields dramatically. So are we ready for that paradigm shift? And if we are ready, then what should be the mechanism? I really don't have any answers or suggestions today as to how it will work, but it is something for all of us to think about and come up with mechanisms which allow us for this um, partnership to work. We are a result of partnership. I'm standing here because the partnership of the 1960s worked. So we strongly believe that this public-private partnership can work also. We have many, many private-private partnerships because our goals are clear. We know how we will share value. We know what it is that each partner will do. If we have similar clarity with the public-private partnership, there's no reason why this cannot work. We also need uh, complete support at the highest level. So in the government, I want my agriculture minister to say, you go forward with this technology. 
then everybody else uh, will, will be willing to discuss the partnership uh, aspect. Uh, similarly, in the, on the company side, I want the CEO to say, this is a partnership that we should pursue. Um, and these are the, this is the kind of support that we need. We also need to identify, if you recall my seed cycle, uh, we need to identify what are the areas where public and private partners want to segment those activities or do it in parallel or do it together. Uh, if we all do all of them uh, for de delivering the same product, my product is inferior to yours, let's say, then I'm not interested in bringing my product forward. So it's very important that we segment what it is that we want to do. Ownership of intellectual property. And this relates to my last point as well, which is a major challenge for the public-private partnership to work. And there is only gray area, there is no black or white. <laughs> when it comes to intellectual property. We have many, many laws, and one particular law now, the National Biodiversity Law, which makes it very challenging for us to transfer knowledge, to look at materials developed by public sector. If I want to access anything to even test, I need to get permission. And these kinds of laws really need to be harmonized and aligned to facilitate public-private partnerships. So in our view, partnership is essential. I put this picture up here because yesterday, if you remember, Secretary of Agriculture, um, Mr. Bahuguna said that when he was a child about this age, he recalls very distinctly that they were asked to not eat one meal a week because that was the condition of our food grain availability in the country. I want us to always remember that we never ever want to, or which one of us will be willing to ask these three young girls that you please don't eat one meal a day because we have not paid enough attention to our research programs and partnerships. So I leave you with that and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>